Welcome to Accounting for Merchandise Entities Part 3. In the past two episodes, we have compared the accounting for merchandise entities versus the service entities. We first compared their income statements and then we focused on the activities that are present on the merchandise entities which are not applicable to service entities. These activities are the following. Number 1. The accounting for sales, which we have already discussed in the episode 1 for this series, and the accounting for purchase which we finished in the episode 2 and the third one which will be the topic in this episode is the inventory count but before we start if you wanted to take a look at the previous episodes the link is on the description below before we start let's review the new account titles that we have learned so far so on the accounting for merchandising part 1, we have learned about the entries related to the accounts, sales, sales returns and allowances, and sales discounts. These three are actually the ones composing the net sales because net sales is gross sales less these two accounts. Aside from that, we have learned about how to account for the freight out cost or the transportation cost incurred to deliver the goods to customers, which is a selling expense. I'll give you an additional information about this, which is freight cost incurred to deliver goods to consignees if you are the consigner are not included as freight out, but it will be included as freight in. Some of you might think, why is it included as freight in? Think of this this way. Freight in is the direct cost in bringing the inventories in the selling area, like a store or something. So this means what? This means if you are the consignor, the selling area is in the consignee's premises. So any cost in bringing your inventories to your consignees are considered as freight in. Aside from that, you also need to remember this. Freight is not all about transportation cost only. It also includes costs like labor cost for lifting and transfer of the goods and other costs. Aside from freight out, I have also given another example of a selling cost like the sales commission paid to selling agents and consignees. In the second part of the merchandising series, we have these four account titles which are actually part of the net purchases. Remember, net purchases is composed of purchases plus freight in minus purchase returns and allowances minus purchase discounts. I have also introduced the account purchase discount loss, although it is not part of the net purchases but part of the operating expenses. Now, it's time to answer why do we need to do an inventory count? Of course, we do an inventory count to establish the merchandise inventory ending account. Why do we need to do so? It is because we need to get the cost of sales. Some of you might ask, how about the merchandise inventory beginning, sir? It is also needed to get the cost of sales. Well, merchandise inventory beginning is just the merchandise inventory end of the previous year or the previous period. So if you understand how to compute the merchandise inventory end, then no need to worry about the merchandise inventory beginning. Now, let's compute for the merchandise inventory ending. Again, inventory count is done to establish the ending inventory. So there are two things that you need to find in order to get the ending inventory value. These are number one, the number or quantity of the inventory, and the second one is the cost per unit. Let's talk about first the quantity of the inventory, and the cost per unit will be the topic later. The quantity of the inventory should be the goods unsold that your company owned. Again, those are unsold goods that your company still owns. To be specific, it includes the following. Number one, we have the goods that are counted in your warehouse. Number two, the goods that are not in the warehouse already but is still in the property of your company like for example, those that are in the shipping area or packaging area already. Those must still be included in your company's inventories. Number three, you need also to include goods which are still in transit from your supplier under the terms FOB shipping point. And remember, if the problem is silent, the shipping terms to be assumed is FOB shipping point. You also add those goods that you sold in your customers but are still in transit if the shipping terms is FOB destination. And of course, 
you also need to include the unsold goods you have sent to consignees. Lastly, you need to deduct the goods that you are holding as a consignee because you don't own them. So that's it. I hope you realize that this quantity of goods that I'm talking about here does not only include goods remaining at your warehouse. So, in order for you not to forget, let us have an application. So let's assess if the items 1 to 4 here should be included in the inventory quantity in the year end 20x1. Now, let's start. Upon reviewing the inventories for the year 20x1, you found the following. Number 1. Product costing 12,000 was in the shipping room when the inventory count in the warehouse was conducted. The product was shipped and the customer was billed only on January 4, 20x2. The question is, are these inventories included in the quantity? Answer, yes, of course, they should be included because it's still in the property of your company. Next is we have number 2, which the company received merchandise but it was marked on consignment. So meaning, those goods should not be included because you don't own those. In number 3, the goods were received only on 20x2. That's very clear from a supplier and it is still in transit in 20x1. But as I have told you, if it is silent, the shipping terms is FOB shipping point. So it means, even if it's still in transit, the inventory is already yours and it should be included. And lastly, in item 4, you have products fabricated to a particular customer's needs, which is in the shipping room on 1231-20x1. It was only shipped on 1220x2 or the next year already. That means it is still in your property at the end of 20x1. So if we follow this, then it is to be concluded that this inventory should still be included in the inventories that you owned, right? But because of the statement which... It said that the products are designed or customized for a particular customer. These products are already considered sold and it should not be included in your inventories already. So that's the twist here. So let me repeat. If you are the seller, even if the goods are already in your packaging room or shipping room, as long as it is still in your company's property, the default is it is still included in your inventories owned, except if those goods are customized for a specific customer. So that's it for the quantity of inventories that you owned. Next is we will answer the question, how do we get the cost per unit of the inventories? Again, we need two items to establish the merchandise inventory and we have the quantity and we have the cost per unit. The quantity was already finished a while ago so let's focus on getting the cost per unit. So how do we get the cost per unit? It depends of course. We can opt to get the exact cost of the ending inventory but only if the goods that you are selling are very few and highly valued. And that is what do we call as specific identification method. But if your goods are small value items and you are purchasing them at large quantities, plus you are purchasing them at different dates and at different prices, then specific identification is not possible. To illustrate, we have here two scenarios in this slide. Let's focus on the first one. Your company is selling luxurious cars. During the year, you purchased three cars worth, the car number one is worth 2 million, car number two is worth 5 million, and car number three is worth 10 million. Two cars were sold during the year. So let's analyze. So the analysis for this is the cost of one car that was unsold can be easily identified of course because of the nature of your business which is selling of only few high value items. I don't think you can forget which of these cars are unsold and if you can identify it then you can also remember the cost of that unsold car. So that's what do we mean by specific identification. We have here another case. So in this case, as you can see here, the purchase of goods is of large quantities, plus the goods are purchased at different dates and at different prices. So if you have this ending inventory, which is in this case 9,700 units, it would be difficult to specifically trace the cost of this because you will be confused. What do I mean? What I mean is of these 9,700 units, which of these costs 4.5? 
how many of these items cost 4.7 or 4.8 or 4.6. So again, specific identification is impossible for this case. If not impossible, then it would be time consuming. And so, instead of specific identification, there are a lot of methods that can be used to get the cost per unit and that would be up next. So, how to compute the ending inventory for this case number 2 that I introduced a while ago? So, we have the first method known as the FIFO or the first in first out. In this method, we have two, the FIFO periodic and the FIFO perpetual. Let's first start with FIFO periodic. But before we do that, let's revisit again the case number 2. So, the concept of FIFO is very straightforward. From the words first in and first out, you just have to assume that the goods purchased first are also the ones sold first. So meaning, the unsold goods comes from the goods purchased last. So applying that in this case, we can say that on the remaining 9,700 units, 3,000 units comes from here, which cost 4.8 per unit. So, how about the remaining 6,700, sir? So, under the FIFO method, let's look for the latest purchase aside from this, which is this one. So, the 6.5 comes from here, which costs 4.6 per unit. So, as of this point, we have already assigned cost per unit for the total of 9,500 units. So, the only units without cost is the remaining 200 units. Following again the FIFO logic, these units are assumed to come from here, which cost 4.7. So, 200 times 4.7. So, in total, we have 45,240. This is the cost of the 9,700 units remaining under the FIFO periodic. Let's have the FIFO perpetual. What makes it different from FIFO periodic is that, as you can see here, the FIFO periodic is only focused on the remaining inventory, which is in this case, the 9,700 units, while FIFO perpetual on the other hand considers each of these transactions. What do I mean? Let's try to answer this case using FIFO perpetual, and let's start with the beginning inventory. So there are 1,000 units at 4.5 per unit. So 1,000 times 4.5, we will have a total cost of 4,500. And the running balance is also 4,500. Next is we have purchases of 10,000, which costs 4.7 per unit. The total for this one is 47,000. The running balance is now 47,000 plus 4,500 which will become 51,500. So that's how the process of perpetual works. It is not just focused on the 97 units ending inventory. Now, let's continue. On 5-1, you return 2,300 units to your suppliers. Maybe because there are defects in them. So, let's put here the units. The problem is, we cannot have the cost per unit. So, what is the cost per unit that we are going to put here? The answer is 4.7. Because if the problem is silent, it is logical to think that the purchase returns came from the latest purchase. Like in this particular example, it is not logical to think that these returns came from the beginning inventory group. Remember, this beginning inventory group has been purchased in the last period. So supposedly, if there are inventory problems in this group, they would have been uncovered in the last period already. If you understand that, then let's move on and total this. So we will have 10,810. And since this is a purchase return and it clearly decreases the inventory, so it should be deducted from the running balance and you will get 40,690. Now, because of these returns, these 10,000 units right here will be deducted by 2,300 units. So the updated quantity for this purchase on 331 will become 7,700 units only. So that's it for these purchase returns. Now, on 7-1, 
another set was purchased 6,500 units at 4.6 so we can put it right here so 6,500 times 4.6 the total cost for this one is 29,900 and we need to add this to the running total and we will get 70,590 now, there's no problem with that except that it was followed by a sales of 10,000 units on 9-1. So, we have the units. However, we don't know the cost of these sales. So again, let's visit the concept of FIFO. The FIFO method states that it is assumed that the goods purchased first are the ones sold first. So, the first group that is assumed sold is this group the beginning inventory group which costs 4.5 per unit so let's put that right here so 1000 times 4.5 we have 4500 the next group that is assumed sold is this group which is again the updated quantity is only 7700 units because of the purchase returns so this group costs 4.7 per unit so let's put that right here so the total is 77 times 4.7, it's 36,190. So now, out of the 10,000 units sold, we already figured out the cost for 8,700 units. So that's 1,000 units plus 77 units. So the remaining 1,3 should come from this group, which has a cost of 4.6. So let's put that right here. So we have 1,3 times 4.6 that's 5980 now the cost of the 10,000 units sold is now complete and since we're talking about sales which clearly decreases the inventories of the company then the total of this one for the 10,000 units should be deducted from the running balance of 70,590 and we will get 23,920 Next is on 11-1, your customers returned 1,500 units. So we have again the units. The problem again is the cost of those sales returns. The assumption is similar with the purchase returns. The cost for this should come from the latest sales. So meaning the latest sales is 1,300 at 4.6. So we need to put it right here. The sales returns of 1,3 times 4.6 is 5,980. So we have still the unaccounted of 200 units. So that means the 200 units comes from this group of sales which cost 4.7 per unit. So we need to put it also right here. So you have 200 times 4.7, that's 940. And since the customers return goods and our inventories were increased, then the running balance of the inventory should be added by the total of this one. And we will come up with a running balance of 30,840. The last transaction on 12.15 is the purchase of 3,000 units at 4.8. So we just need to put it right here and add this 14,400 with the running balance and we have the 45,240. As you can see, the results for FIFO periodic and the FIFO perpetual is basically the same. The question is, is it always like that? The answer is yes. That is why if the question is how much is the inventory and under FIFO perpetual, to solve it faster, I personally solve it using the FIFO periodic. So that's it for this video. So there are other methods to compute the merchandise inventory end and that would be the topic for the next video. If this helped, please click like, subscribe, and comment if you have questions.